But as you said, Sadhguru, we are moving from the, the feudal, the medieval no, no, no. system we, to a modern system, and we would like both competence and integrity to be together. You ask for a practical solution. That's a reasonable solution. aspiration. You ask for a practical solution, not an ethical answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, we must understand the leadership as a whole in the last two hundred years has been… there has been a metamorphosis. A, f a few centuries ago, religious leadership was the most powerful leadership. Even if a king was in place, religious leaders controlled him. After some time, his power went away and the military leadership took over. We suffered the dogmatism of religious leadership and came down to the tyranny of the military leadership. Then we have moved on in the last hundred and fifty years on this planet to the confoundedness of the democratic leadership. A simple decision that one man can make, five hundred and forty people sit together and they can't make a decision in ten thousand years. What the country needs, everybody knows, but they can't take a decision because to make five hundred and forty, forty people agree to one idea is going to take a long time. By the time you take a decision is irrelevant most of the time. So I'm not talking about pessimism, I'm saying this confoundedness is there across the planet and nations and planet is suffering for this. Whether it's ecological loss or the, you know, many things, human rights and things, you can't take any decision because various interest groups and things keep pulling and pushing. Now one thing is happening, that is now leadership is moving into the hands of economic leaders or the business leaders. In the next fifteen to twenty years, you will see economic leadership will become far more important than political leadership. We are heading there, clearly. Even now, it is already very much there. In many countries, it's the businesses which decide what the politicians should do. We have done a different kind of job. We have an economist as a prime minister. The fact is, he is not a politician because he can never get elected. He's never been elected. So we are not following democracy because democracy happens by election. Right now we are running the nation by selection. Because we are trying… as… as uh, we have our own jugad for everything, you know. Across the planet, this is happening. The power is moving from political leadership to economic leadership. Here, economic leadership has not come to that level. So we have put an economist as a leader who is not… who has no political capabilities. In a democratic society, a political leader means if he stands up, a million people should stand up with him, only then he is a political leader, <laughs> otherwise he cannot be. So now it is moving to… into the hands of business. Always we have seen business as vested interest. They have the tag of vested interest hanging around their neck. This is a responsibility, I don't know whether they will stand up to it. In the last ten, twelve years, I am constantly in dialogue with economic leaders across the planet and also in this country, mainly because I see in the next few years the world will be theirs. But they have always been seen as vested interests because these are people who are operating out of personal ambitions. To transform them from personal ambition to a larger vision is the most significant thing we need to do right now because whether you like it or you don't like it, the power will shift from political leadership to economic leadership. If you don't shift it consciously, it will move from economic leadership to criminalization because a criminal is a businessman, personal ambition is what is driving him. But he doesn't go by the law, that's all the difference is. And now you see, many business people are also not going by the law because law is ambiguous and law is enforced ad hoc, it's enforced on me, not enforced on you. Now I think, why should I go by the law? I will also find some other way to do it. This culture is setting in. So if we do not shift this consciously, unconscious haphazard shifting will happen, naturally criminals will become leaders. You should not be surprised. People who have proper criminal records, if they become prime minister of this country in the next twenty years, you should not be surprised if we do not do anything about it now. That's the challenge, Sadhguru. What do we do? That's the precise question I'm asking. Because… What do we do? I, I entirely agree with you because 
if power goes to businessmen, that's not going to be the best answer either. As you said, there's going to be Western interest there, while they have no, to be partners they in have the been vested interests. About ten, eleven years ago, in the World Economic Forum, I coined this word called inclusive economics. Since then, this word has been bouncing around in many places, even the prime ministers of the nations are talking inclusive economics. If a more inclusive way of approaching economics happens, a businessman is a good leader because the thing about the businessman is he's flexible. He doesn't believe anything. He has no qualms about anything. If the deal is good, he will do it. Even if he has to do a deal with the devil, he will deal with the devil. He has no prejudice. The deal is good, he will do it. I'm saying he's the most pragmatic man in the society, he's the businessman. But right now, he is driven by his personal ambition. To shift him to a larger vision is a challenge, which last twelve years we have been actively working on. With individual people, we have succeeded phenomenally. And in the larger context, this is something very heartening on one level is, today if you meet the businesses of the world across the planet, like never before, there are many business leaders who are thinking how to do business in such a way that it will do some good to the world. It is very important this because a business means, business activity means just this. If I make some transaction, it is beneficial to both of us. Only if it is beneficial to both of us, this activity will be sustained. If it's only beneficial for me, it will not go on. Only beneficial for you, it'll not go on. Whether it's ma marriage or marketplace, this is true, isn't it? If it's only beneficial for one person, it is not going to last. Only if the transaction is beneficial for both, it will last. So in that context, the world moving towards business leadership is a good thing. But the business leadership has to mature and evolve, which needs to be worked at. And of all the types of leadership that I have mentioned, religious, military, democratic and business leaders, I have found personally business leaders are the easiest ones to work with because they are willing to listen to something if it makes sense to them. Religious leaders will not listen to anything because they already got instructions from elsewhere. But Sadhguru, we need to do something fast because the kind of crisis we're getting into in this country, it's getting deeper. If you see the political parties, with all their imperfections, they held the country together so far, but now even they are breaking apart. They are simply breaking down. For a party to survive, you require ideas and idealism and agenda. You require committed leadership which is trusted. And you require the promise of power. Increasingly, in most of the major political parties of India, all these three are disappearing. Long ago, idealism and agenda have gone. Leadership, for whatever reasons, the respect is increasingly diminished. And as the slightest threat appears to their political survival, suddenly parties are catapulting, uh, they're collapsing. So unless some quick decisions are made by the political uh, people of the country, by the media, by the spiritual gurus, and by the citizenry at large, I'm afraid we're going to have some very tumultuous time. If you're looking for a solution, you must understand this right now. Even if it's a political leader, what is it that the people of this nation are expecting him to deliver? An economic answer, isn't it? They're not asking him to teach a philosophy. They're not asking him to give some teaching. They want an economic answer, yes or no? They want an economic answer, okay, how can I do my business, where can I get a job, what can I do? This is the question they're asking. So when this is the question they're asking, the leadership should have the necessary business, you know, capabilities. The leadership in India has no clue what's business, you understand? They are still think they are law enforcers. Yes, they are on one level, yes, they are policy makers on another level but they have no clue how to do business. It's very, very important that we strengthen the business leadership and put proper laws.
At least first thing if we cannot, you know, uh, rehaul or overhaul all the laws on the, in the country, at least the economic rules. What are the ways you can do business, what are the ways you cannot do business in this country? These laws must be drawn up immediately, immediately. Every day you postpone, the well-being of the country is being postponed by years and decades. So, if you make this and encourage people, because in 1996 in India, only three percent of the population was employed, ninety-seven percent was self-employed. So, we are essentially entrepreneurs. Ninety-seven percent of the population survive without jobs. We are great entrepreneurs, but we are only selling chikadkai, half a kilogram of chikadkai, this is our enterprise. And we spend a whole day, one person will spend a whole day selling half a kilogram of chikadkai. But do not underestimate this half a kilogram. Because to sell this half a kilogram, he understands where he should stand, what he should say, what is the current politics, what is the latest cinema, he knows everything and he quotes things and he markets his chikadkai. Yes or no? So I am saying there is this capability in the country, but we are trying to module now an economic model. For whatever reasons, I am not going into the philosophy of it, the communistic way of existence, the socialist way of existence has collapsed. As an ideal, it's a fantastic thing that everybody needs by… lives by his need, not by his greed, is a fantastic idea, but it did not work. So now we have chosen a market economy. Once you have market economy, you must understand that greed is good. If people don't have hunger, ambition, market economy will collapse. Our problem right now in this country is, we say this is a market economy. If somebody does well, we'll say, see, he's so greedy. This is not going to work. Somebody wants to gold paint himself and walk on the street. For me personally, it may be vulgar, but he likes to gold paint himself and walk on the street, that's his problem. But that is allowed in a market economy. Do you understand? We try to control these morals, now you kill the ambition. If you kill the ambition, you kill the market. So we must decide, are we going for market economy or are we going for socialist way of living? If we take steps in market, there is no time or no opportunity to look back and say, oh, that would be nice, there's no such thing. Both the systems have their problems. Greed is not the good way to structure a society, but right now the whole world is being structured that way. The only way you can make greed productive is proper economic loss and unbridled opportunity for people to do business. For that, we need a businessman leading the nation. Sadhguru, in your interactions with the business leaders, have you seen the inclination to accept this responsibility, to take up this challenge, to risk failure in and a to very do whatever big it way. takes? In a very big way right now in the world. Well, that's very good news. Internationally, it is very true. But in India? In the country, because not so Because my universe now is India at this point of time. Not… see, no, that is the thing. Once you are ruled by business, national boundaries become irrelevant. This happened uh, in 2007 or 8. I was at Davos. This is Pakistani breakfast. Musharraf, General Musharraf was speaking. The hall was packed. Everybody wanted to hear what's going, what he's going to talk. I also got invited, I went. And he spoke and spoke and spoke. People are looking at, these are all business people, they're looking at, okay, what are your economic policies? Can we do business in your country or no? That's all they want to know. But this man went on saying how he knows how he is a great leader and how his leadership did this and that and he was giving leadership lessons to everybody. Every one of them is a leader by himself. But he was giving leadership lessons and the whole time, two hour time, he spent one and a half hours. And then uh, there was no time left. So he said, only one question. This was supposed to be an interactive session, but he did all the talking. Then uh, I raised my hand because I had already met him previously. He said, okay, you. So I stood up and asked him, see, right now India and Pakistan, both of them 
we are actually not developed countries, we like to call ourselves developing because we're developing for too long. <laughs> Forever if you're developing, you're not a developing country, okay? If you're developing somewhere, you must become developed. I said this is happening for too long. The reason is, one major reason is both the nations are spending enormous amount of money on this defense and nonsense. If India and Pakistan had known these issues, both the countries probably would have prospered by now. But somehow we couldn't keep that nonsense down, we fought all these years. Just three wars are not the thing. Preparing for the war is a horribly expensive process. I said, see, you don't expect the religious leaders in your country, in our country to come to any agreement. It's a waste of time doing all these interfaith meetings and things. Anyway, they will pretend and go home and they will preach their own thing, okay? Two military leaders cannot agree because we are pointing guns at each other, we are trained to shoot. Political leaders cannot agree because that will make them lose elections. But a business person has no issue. If there is a good deal in Pakistan, every Indian businessman will go and do deals in Pakistan. If there is a bridge to be built for a one million dollar bridge, they are offering two million dollars, half of Hyderabad will go there. So I said, see the first thing is, let's open up the business. If you open up the business, if daily transactions are happening, my people are on that side, your people on this side, my money there, your money here, I wouldn't want to bomb your country, you wouldn't want to bomb my country. Gladly that's beginning to happen now, this transaction business uh, relationship in India and Pakistan. Because national borders will go away, that is very important. On the longer run, it is very important national borders get diluted. That is when armies will come down, that is when the potential of fighting on the planet will go down. That is when development will happen indiscriminately, according to capability, not according to national identity, isn't it? So this transaction should happen. And he… just previous day he was talking about how he's for peace and how he's looking for this and that, looking for support and money, but he forgot all that and he burst out. He said, how can we do business? You know, my dear friend, somebody he mentioned name, he died in my arms in the war. I named my son after him because of that. We have spilled blood, we have lost people. How can we do business? We cannot do business. International press was amazed that this man just came out and said, we cannot do business with each other, being the head of a nation. But if we started doing business, don't do any of these, all these parlays which are very expensive, politicians meeting anyway, it's a foregone conclusion, it's not going to go anywhere. Do business as much business as possible, you will see people will forget who the hell is a Pakistani, who is a Indian. Uh, I think that's very insightful Sadhguru, I think what you initiated is now bearing fruit because I think India and Pakistan are now willing to do business at last. Sadhguru, before we open to the floor, uh, I limit to a couple of inquiries. We have, as you often said, great technology and vast resources today, better than ever before in any other generation. But as a society, as a country, we seem to be very poor in organization. Oh, you don't talk I'll, about that. <laughs> I'll give two specific illustrations to make this point, so that that line of inquiry can be pursued further. Finland, the tiny Scandinavian country, tiny in terms of population at least, it had every single birth and death registered 500 years ago. It's a genetic… it's a haven for genetic research today. Even today in India, in any city, let alone small towns, we cannot claim that every birth and death is registered. It doesn't cost money, it's not a technological issue, organization. But a more important example, every year roughly about 200,000 children are born in this country with preventable congenital abnormalities, birth defects that could have been prevented largely because of two reasons. One is a viral disease called rubella. If only every girl child before pregnancy or before marriage is given that vaccination, there's a fully effective vaccine. Thousands of these serious deformities would have been prevented. It's not costly at all. And the second is consanguineous marriages in South India 
you know, we have this very sorry tradition of marrying cousins without realizing the consequences in terms of genetic… Uh, we don't want our property to go to somebody else. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but if only we had organization to make people aware, it's not even a question of money. If only efforts are made in the direction, vast amount of good can be done. So how do you promote outside of business? Business is an area where organizations are improving. But outside of business, except Isha Foundation and a few organizations, very few are actually able to organize well to be able to deliver exceptional outcomes. What can be done to, to, to really promote specific, well-directed action based on organization? Somewhere, can I say something? Somewhere in your mind structure and in the minds of many, many, many Indians, particularly middle-class Indians, business is still a bad word. This must go. I'm saying even delivering the vaccine, can be delivered by a business. It will be delivered much more efficiently, properly and if they don't deliver it properly, you can ask them. You can demand that you want it because you paid for it or somebody paid for it. Right now, because it's a government agency or it's a social organization, whether it's Isha Foundation or somebody else, because we are delivering it as charity or a service, people cannot demand, why have you not done this? If it was business, they would have asked, why have you not done this? Otherwise we won't do business with you, we'll do business with somebody else. We'll buy the vaccine from somebody, not from you. So business is not a bad word. Social organizations like ours and so many others have become necessity, necessity because one thing is administration is not able to perform the duties that it was supposed to perform, like health, education, nourishment, ecology, this is not my business. You know, like I went <laughs> I went somewhere and uh, this p big professor from Harvard University comes and says, Oh, you are that amazing tree planter? I said, No, I'm not a tree planter. He said, No, you planted so many million trees. I said, yes, I did, but I'm not a tree planter. My work is to make people blossom, not to plant trees. The administration should have planted the trees. They didn't plant, so when I have time, I'm planting. <laughs> So, planting a tree, building a school, building a hospital is actually not my business. It should not be if the nation is functional. These are things the administration should do if it is uh, that kind of medicine, if there is that kind of a Medicare system. Otherwise, businesses should do. Now, first thing if you say business in health is, you will say they will exploit, they will charge. Do you know how much this hospital is charging, that hospital is charging, it's all true. But now, if ten hospitals like that came, market, demand and supply would bring it down to reasonable levels. Right now there's only one good one, so they're charging astronomical prices. If ten like this came up, you would choose where to go, where it's sensible to go, isn't it? and proper loss to see that they don't misuse and exploit this capability. So business is not a bad word. Social organizations can fill in the gap for some time. They can never be a total solution. I'm saying Isha Foundation is not a solution for all the problems of this nation. If thousand organizations like this come up, we function very efficiently with absolute dedication, but still I'm saying this is not a solution. This is only a patchwork, this is only a band-aid for a cancer. The problem is so huge, we do little, little things and people think you're doing great things. I just tell them what is a great thing. The problem is so big and you do little thing and it's a great thing. Why? Because nothing has been done. Because nothing has been done, the little thing is a great thing, isn't it? However dedicated we are, however capable we are, Social organizations are not the ultimate solution for nation's problems. Once we have taken to market economy, we should allow the market and the forces of the market to function and the market should be guided by appropriate laws so that it doesn't lead to too much exploitation. That is the only way because we have chosen market economy. We cannot go back to socialistic ways of functioning on one level, market economy on the other level, it will lead to confusion. 
Right now that is what is happening in Indian minds. They're confused. They don't know whether to make profit or to make charity. I'm saying, let the business be structured in such a way, if I do business, naturally everybody must benefit. This is the rule of law. This is the role of law, that law should be structured in such a way, the laws of business should be structured in such a way, if I do business, everybody around should be benefited, not because of my charity, because of the law. Well, that's, that's wonderful, Sadhguru that market principles must be applied and competition and choice must be the cornerstones, even in social, socially productive work of this kind. I, I don't critical. trust people's morality, I don't trust people's ethics, I've seen enough of it and I know in how many ways it can be sub, sub, subverted. That's why I'm saying the law must be clear and law must be enforced. And that's a powerful message, uh, Sadhguru. One last question before we leave it to the floor, Sadhguru. We are all proud of our own culture, tradition, or history, or philosophy. After all, each country is proud of its own past, and we probably have greater um, claim to uh, some exceptional accomplishments as a society and civilization. But there are two problems that are recurring in the modern context. The first is, even in the minds of people of our background sitting here, otherwise enlightened and liberal, there is this moral neutrality to inequality by birth. While we treat people who don't have an opportunity because of circumstances, because of poverty, with a lot of kindness, with a lot of compassion, we do not realize that those children are entitled to the same opportunity that my child is entitled to. It's, it's simply alien, it appears to me, to our culture unless a very strong message goes consistently, unless everybody is allowed to rise, everybody will fall eventually. The second deficit appears to be, more or less as a corollary of this, a trust deficit, an incapacity to recognize that there is a common fate binding all of us. Politicians blaming bureaucrats, bureaucrats blaming judges, judges and politicians and bureaucrats together blaming media, all of them blaming somebody else. This is a blame-throwing and treating the other fellow as a nuisance and not being able to look at the bigger whole and our own role in making the bigger things happen seems to be a very special Indian problem. What do you advocate, Sadhguru, to address these two challenges? See, we need to understand India. The problem is, we are trying to look at India through a Western education window. Right now, all the educated Indians, somewhere there is one window of Western education, rest of it is total chaos and we like chaos. We are a colorful mess. As long as you're not trying to work with somebody, their Indians are fine because everybody is a genius by himself. But you can't organize a genius and get results. By themselves they are good, you try to put them together, there's a big problem. So what India is, is why it is like this is, I already mentioned this in passing. One thing is, India does not have beliefs and India has never had moral code. See, every other nation has strict moral code, people feel guilty about certain things. An Indian can just do just about anything very happily. Do you understand? <laughs> I have had the misfortune of sometimes closely interacting with some very famously corrupt people right now in the country. When I really looked at them closely, what I saw was they did not even think they're doing something wrong. So your ideas of morality, ethics, uh, they're shocked that you're saying you're complaining. After all, I become a minister, shouldn't I make some money? What are you talking? I'm saying they're not even… I mean, they're surprised that you people are complaining because India is not… has never had a moral code, but still people remained in a certain way because there was a spiritual ethos. People told you everything is your karma, 
whatever you do, there will be a consequence and people stirred up certain other dimensions within you. Every generation had people who would stir up this possibility of consciousness within you. We operated out of continuous stirring up of con uh, consciousness, never morality. Now we have come to a place where in the last few hundred years or few generations, nobody has come, I won't say nobody, not enough people have come to stir up consciousness. And consciousness has gone low, no morality, we are between the two cultures, we are falling in the gap. We have lost our way of keeping ourselves in check, but we still cannot take on Western way of strict morality and we are falling in the gap in between, that's where we are. See, right now, it's seriously happening like yes, you said yesterday's yesterday election results and everywhere else, whether it's Bengal or UP or Tamil Nadu or wherever else. Gradually in India, there is no party which you can call as national party, all regional parties. As regional parties becoming more and more powerful and they sweep the state and natural… national parties are co completely routed. I am not trying to pitch for them because there is nothing to defend them, <laughs> okay? But whichever way, whatever they may be, for the long-term interest of the nation, it's a very important one, two or three national parties must become strong. Otherwise, after twenty-five to fifty years, we will wonder, why are we one nation? Suddenly one chief minister will become prime minister. A chief minister who is chief minister for ten years and frustrated with his chief ministership, wants to become a prime minister. When he sees there is no other way to become a prime minister there, he will become a prime minister here. Yes. And already some serious att attempts in this direction have been made in the past in certain states. If we value India as a nation, it's very important that we must strengthen the national parties. How to join these parties? Both are a mess. That is a real problem, what to do? But what we need to understand is, there is people, there are parties and there is administration. In Indian mind, these three things are distinctly separate. This distinction should go. There is no people, party and administration. There is people, people and people. This is what a democracy means. People who are sitting here in this chair, tomorrow could be walking the street campaigning for a party, day after tomorrow they could be in that chair. This is what democracy means, that you are here today, tomorrow you could be there. So this distinction has to go. These are all easier said than done to remove these distinctions, to make people understand because how many people can you even talk to in this country? Because you know only two languages, yes? Maybe I know three languages, but how many people will you speak? There are sixteen, twenty-four languages in the country, who are you going to speak, who are you going to leave out? So there are these issues, there are these issues but it is very, very important. However corrupt, however nonsensical, however rubbish it is, it is important to strengthen two or three national parties, otherwise there will be no India after fifty years, there will be many countries. Sadhguru, I, <clears throat> I actually entirely agree with you and Lok Sattva and I have been always articulating the need to strengthen national parties. The tragedy is they are their worst enemies. So we do require to transform politics. That's why I was so repeatedly in pleading. I don't unless blame we you find at all. An I wouldn't like to join any national party because we know what's happening and the way it's conducted. So how but do we that is the reality of our nation. But unless we transform them, unless that's the reason why I'm pushing this today, unless the pressure comes from the spiritual gurus, from the civil society, from media, that the need of the hour is not merely replacing one with the other, but actual transformation of the nature of politics and building a framework for the unity of India. I entirely agree with you. So I am there, privately, there not I publicly, not… Oh, privately. Not announcing to people, oh, whatever it giving them that privacy. Privately, we are slowly trying to transform many political leaders in the country. We have successfully worked with a few people, others are slowly coming in. 
but it's still a long process, it's not something that will happen overnight. An India… a country like India cannot be ch turned around overnight. If we work as a generation of people, maybe we'll leave a little better country for the next generation. That's where we need to look at. The most significant thing right now in the nation is, people have come to a place where they're willing to give up their caste, creed, ideology, everything for economic well-being. This may be described as greed by certain people. I see it as a possibility. There is only one ethos, everybody wants to do economically well. This is an opportunity to transform the nation. When they're economically down, you ask them to leave their religion and come beyond that. You ask them to leave their caste and creed and come beyond that, they will not come because that net is a security. Belonging to a certain caste, belonging to a certain religion, belonging to a certain community has been their security for centuries, for thousands of years. Suddenly you ask them to come out, they won't come. Only if you throw up a big opportunity and a dream out there, people will crawl out of those nets, risking their life. So economic opportunity is the most important thing right now. Personally, it leaves this taste in my mouth to go on talking and pitching for economic possibilities because that's not going to transform human life. But right now if nation has to crawl out of the pit, social, economic and political pit it is in, right now I see the only solution is economic development should happen. It'll come at various costs will be there, there will be a price to pay for that. But we must pay the price, otherwise we'll stagnate where we are. Sadhguru, that practical wisdom actually is music to my ears. Unless we have such unrelenting focus on economic growth and rapid economic growth, I entirely agree our both political and social problems will only be exacerbated. I think we ha should give a, an opportunity to the floor to raise, I'm sure, far more interesting questions. How do we find this balance, the balance between this base need and this high need of spirituality? Because I think that in the, we are in the middle and what we want is an ease in life in this democracy so that we can all become seekers and concentrate on seeking as opposed to concentrating on surviving. That's my question. The question is for him, right? No, it's for you Sadhguru, the balance is about you. We are all imbalanced people <laughs> Now, if, uh, I will simplify this. How do I bring a balance between Right now I am hungry, I am. Right now I am hungry, how to fill this and how to attain to the highest goal, whatever that is, mukti or liberation or how to fill my belly and how to meditate. How to make these two things happen? You are addressing it as if they are two separate things. Do not address it as two separate things. You are a human being. You are a human being who's come with both the needs. But when you are hungry, if I ask you to meditate, you are not going to meditate, will you? And I will not ask you to meditate because I think when a man is hungry, asking him to meditate is vulgar. It's an obscenity to… when somebody is hungry, you talk to him about mukti, I think it's obscene. I will not do such a thing. If he's hungry, we must see how first the food should happen, then only we can talk about another dimension. So do not look at it as two separate things, but physical need is an urgent need. Meditation, you could postpone it to tomorrow. Dinner, you must have today, isn't it? <laughs> so economics is the need right now because half the population has still not eaten properly yet. You can talk meditation only to those who have eaten well, not to those who have not eaten well, we don't do such things. That is why Isha has a spiritual aspect and a social aspect. I don't like to do the social thing. If the administration had taken care of all the social needs, I would like to do just the spiritual part. But if I do just the spiritual part, I will leave out half the population. So I am doing the social thing with them. So do not separate it. If you… your stomach becomes full, immediately the other need will naturally come up within you. I don't have to tell you, you meditate. You will start looking, what do I need to fulfill my life? Because this is the nature of a human being. If you came here as some other creature, 
stomach full, life settled. Once you come as a human being, stomach empty, only one problem. Stomach full, one hundred problems. So, once your stomach becomes full, you will seek other things. You don't have to be told, you will seek anyway. Then other things will come anyway. That's why we are talking so much about economics right now. I think there is a hint from Sadhguru that we should wind up because he's hungry. Um, who is next? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> who is next? Um, yes, this young man. In, in politics, you, you said you require a business outlook leader, so that, that perhaps it means like instead of people who share hundred rupees, you want people to make hundred to thousand rupees and share five hundred rupees. That, that's, that's what… No, I'm not talking about sharing. See, he said, he said, politicians have spent some five hundred crores something. I said, no, they have invested. So, but the problem is, it is a business, but it's an illegal business. There is no law monitoring it rigidly enough to make it a legal business. Now in United States of America, right now Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are going around the country raising millions of dollars for their election. But it's a legal business. If he takes one dollar more illegally, he'll go to prison. We just have to do that, isn't it? Right, Guru. Uh, coming to my question, it's like there's been uh, this bipolar elections. I went to, a went to the campaign because, you know, motivated… You must arrive at the question quickly. Yeah, because… Not because I am hungry, because so many hands are going up. But there has to be a background formed for the question because otherwise it's difficult to understand. No, we are capable so, of understanding the context. <laughs> the question, if I have to put in a nutshell, then how an intellectual and a person with a business outlook can stand for elections and win? This culture of economics has still not come. We are in still a culture of charity. We have to bring a culture of economics because you've chosen a market economy. See, this is not a simple decision to make. For the f uh, builders of this nation, they chose a socialistic economy because it was more endearing to think in terms of let's share, let's do things better. You know, it's not about you versus me, let us do this, but it did not work. As an idea, it's a great idea, but it's an idea that's failed because humanity is not ready for such a big idea. Right now, we have come to a much grosser idea, okay? Market economy is a gross idea, very crass way of existence, but it's working better than the very refined idea. I'm interested in making it work because ideals on an empty stomach means nothing. I know four hundred million people in this country have not eaten one good meal in the last ten days probably. So when this is our condition, ideals are a taboo. I'm saying this to him. Ideals are a taboo, nobody ha can have the luxury of having ideals. We just have to do what's needed. After everybody has eaten, then we can talk what is our ideal, what is our philosophy, what is our ethic. First people have to eat because eating cannot be postponed to tomorrow. Philosophy can be postponed to tomorrow, meditation can be postponed to tomorrow, eating cannot be postponed to tomorrow, it has to happen now, isn't it? So for this, once we have chosen econ economic… our economic model is market economy, Please strengthen the market and nothing else but the market. People tell me, what is this? You say you're a spiritual leader, but you're charging for this. I said, I will charge. Somebody who comes who cannot pay, I will do something else. But I want you to understand, if you want something delivered, it costs. Whether you pay for it or somebody else pays for it, it costs. You've gotten used to somebody else paying for it, that is why you don't know how to make use of anything that's offered to you. If you were paying for it, you would make use of it well, isn't it? Yes or no? Right now, rice is free, dal is free, television is free, gas is free. You think you will destroy the work, work culture of this nation completely. In Tamil Nadu today, so many things are free. For, for essentially for election reasons and populistic democracy that we are doing right now, yes, when somebody doesn't have anything, you give him something, it's great. 
But instead of giving something, even if it causes suffering, if you create opportunities where everybody could make money and have the necessary power to buy it, it would be better. Because today, <laughs> this started from Andhra Pradesh, that's why I'm telling you. Rice came at one rupee. A ten rupee rice, if you give it at one rupee, who is paying the nine rupees? Who's asking this question? I'm saying you have chosen a market economy, you cannot do this. It may sound cruel but there are poor people. If the first thing is you are enjoying poverty, this is the biggest problem. Religious people enjoy poverty because they want somebody to serve and go to heaven. Now, businessman does not enjoy poverty, he want everybody to have purchasing power because otherwise he cannot run his business <laughs> I think three powerful messages are coming from you, Swamiji, today. The first order of priority is rule of law, enforcement of rules and laws and public order. The second order of priority is unity of India. Third is economic growth at any cost. I think that's the take home Right now, today. till everybody eats economic growth at Absolutely. any cost. Absolutely. After that, we can control the costs. I am proud to say I voted for Lok Sata. Before I pose this question, I wanted to say this. I don't know there is any else, any other party in the country like this, so I'm very happy for that. My question is, like this, like me, there are a lot of people in this state. First, I'm trying to talk about my state, in this state. But why, what the uh, system is hindering, why we are not able to uh, win more seats? Right now, we just have one legislative. So why can't we have JP as the chief minister or anybody like JP being chief minister? So what is stopping us. So what's Sadhguru's message to the people here because everybody is here, they wanted to do something for the society. But I am sure, like me, I am not doing anything. I just think about it. I do nothing. So like me, I guess there are 50 percent of the people here. So what the message we should get and how we get that education and what we have to do. We are ready to do anything. I am happy the way India is progressing, the media, the RTI, everything is very good. So the question is, the, the, the simple finishing thing we have to get that. So what is the message from you so that we all go to streets and do something for the country? Thank you. Sadhguru, before you intervene… No, it's you who has to answer this. No, no, he, he wanted an answer from you. Answers are from you, questions are from us <laughs> This is an often asked question, it's not about this party or that. That ethical politics is not sustainable in India that what we all desire or we claim to desire is not winnable in India is a proven proposition. I can now say with some degree of confidence across the country. The challenge is how to reverse that. That's the anguish of um, uh, that uh, young man. Sadhguru, you already mentioned the answer, you gave the answer earlier. We all forget the initial conditions of our democracy because we take the normative democratic institutions and the constitution, we think it should operate the way it operates in other countries after a certain degree of maturity. We have not created the initial conditions and Sadhguru is repeatedly emphasizing that. Even today, the voters have no notion that they are electing a representative. They think they are electing a monarch <laughs> and once elected, he somehow will deliver. We don't care how. No rules, no laws, no procedure, get it done somehow or other. And that's not merely the failing of the poor people. It is the failing of our class, Sadhguru. It is the failing of the middle classes, it's the failing of the educated, that's the general perception. The second is, Sadhguru, we created an impossible situation where nothing happens without somebody's intervention. And there is perpetual dissatisfaction because even if the elected person wants to deliver, he cannot fulfill the expectations and therefore money has become the currency of vote getting. And now in the competition to get the votes, in our kind of electoral system, where one vote more means you win, one vote less means you lose. Look at Tamil Nadu, DMK, DMK, how they alternate so dramatically. There is a desperation and a competitive pressure to buy the votes. And that's why today you see in some constituencies, a candidate spending 20 to 30 crores in an assembly election. And that's the reason why I have been arguing for… You, you're not getting it. Investing. Okay. Yes, Sadhguru, you're right. Investing as a business proposition. He is not throwing it away, he's investing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. A straightforward <laughs> business proposition in anticipation of multiple returns, there's no question about it. There are 
two things, and that's the reason why I was urging Sadhguru to take up this issue. One is, we have to bring the, what is the definition of the community is a challenge. But whatever it means, localize power so that citizens are empowered and they understand the limitations of power. Today, because they have no power, they have no responsibility either. Localize power and make them masters of their own resources, but hold a danda so that things don't go beyond a point. And the second is a bigger thing at the national level. Unless we push the political parties, the big national parties, uh, Sadhguru, in the large states of India, UP, Bihar, Bengal, now Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, the six largest states of India, the two grand national parties of this country are more or less decimated. Andhra Pradesh, now it's pretty close to that. The other party was never there. In Maharashtra, both are playing second fiddle. Elsewhere, they are not a factor, which is a unique feature. We are thinking it's normal, it's absolutely unnatural. These parties, once they fall below a certain threshold, they're disappearing in state after state. With the recent fragmentation, this will only get worse. Now is the time for us to make them realize that there's a different way of electing our representatives, where this kind of money pressure is not there. One possibility is, with certain checks and balances, proportionality-based system. Another, at least at the state level, is directly electing the leader. There are models, but we have to now build a consensus and make them realize. Meanwhile, no matter how many hardships we have, once the goal is clear, we have to keep on fighting. I don't see a short-term alternative, unless the Sadhguru and many others, they use all their formidable, spiritual, and temporal influence and authority to move the country in the direction that we all desire, Sadhguru. In that effort, last uh, four years I've been striving to put all the spiritual leaders on one platform. It's called the Confederation. It's, a, it's even tougher than NGO leaders, I thought, <laughs> getting them together and <laughs> Confederation of spiritual, indigenous spiritual movements, we're calling it as Guru Sangamam, putting all the gurus together. I don't want to talk to you about my experience, okay? But we have managed for the first time this year, in the month of April, 123 gurus, prominent ones. We all met. The last four years I've been trying to educate them. We can simply meet without an agenda. There is no need. What is the agenda? What will… what shall we do? Shall we take Padhyatra? Shall we fast? Shall we eat? This is the question. I said, no, we will just be together, maybe share a lunch, just be together. Just because each one of you, each one of us have millions of people. Just coming together is a major event. Let's come together, the power of being together, you're not understanding. So we are doing that, but that is still a long way to become a force by itself, as a guiding force, because each one of them will tend to take or jump to some party or the other. I'm trying to keep them away from any party, let it just be a few things that needs to happen in the nation rather than pitching this party or that party, because once again the same thing will happen. But uh, for you, a man of your integrity, you must jump into a party which is… which you think is of a lesser evil <laughs> but evil. Whichever is a lesser evil, you must jump into that because this young man, he feels proud, I have voted for Lok Sattva. But his pride is just empty pride which will go waste, which will not build a nation. Your integrity, your ethic, your moral, your intentions, your intellect, wanting to do something, all this will go waste unless you have the legs and the hands to do it. It should not go waste. It should not go waste. Because… because I want you to understand this, in… in… in Indian minds, especially in the Indian mind and very much in the American mind, People have put these capsules, okay, this is BJP, this is Congress, this is political, this is non-political, this is administration. There is no such thing in a democracy. Democracy is a continuous metaphor… metamorphosis. The man who is a nobody, tomorrow morning he can become… be sitting in the parliament. This is the possibility and this is the beauty of democracy. You will destroy the beauty of that 
by getting identified with something or the other and you will destroy the power of that by getting identified. So if you have integrity, if you have capability, if you have competence which can make a difference for the people of this country, it's most important you get into a place where you will be most effective. Not just enjoy this satisfaction, I voted for integrity. No, you voted for integrity but against India. You vote for India. You don't vote for integrity, you don't vote for world values, you don't vote for morality, you vote for India. What's good for this country, that is what you vote for. Sadhguru, I, I agree with the broader point that all of us are political. Politics is not a dirty thing and I'm, I'm glad that you're making that point as a spiritual leader. Unless we recognize that we're all in politics, you like it or not, in some form or the other, doesn't mean that you contest, doesn't mean that you're a member of a political party, doesn't mean that you aspire for power, but you actually aspire change. You must aspire for power because if you don't aspire for power, I understand that you have no intention of doing anything for this country. Oh, that I agree. That, that's even more music to my ears. But I'm, I'm now trying to push no, them because, no, up to why, a point. Why I'm speaking like this is, in Indian minds, particularly middle class minds, people who can read newspapers and watch televisions, in these people minds, business is a bad word, power is a bad word. No, these are not bad words. These have gotten into bad hands, that is the problem. These are good things. That's a terrific message, Sadhguru. Uh, who has the microphone? Uh, the, my problem is, I, I have a longing to do something, but uh, all my energy and my time is expended to satisfy my definition of my personal and my family well-being. Uh, how do I break my vicious cycle and have a sol seeking a solution? Thank you. This Sadhguru, a, you are the best this person This is a answer. satsang question, this is not a <laughs> As uh, Jayaprakash already said, your well-being is not independent of the social well-being. Your well-being is not independent of the national well-being. Your well-being is not independent of the global well-being. If you understand this, you will operate more sensibly. I, I, I'm delighted Sadhguru, if I may just add, you know, we should do something beyond what appears to be immediately necessary for ourselves, not because we are very charitable or moral, but because the mosquito in the neighborhood, which has bitten an urchin there, will enter your home no matter how wealthy you are, no matter no, how successful you are. they have up their house. Are. They have completely meshed their house. Uh, but you still have to open the door, you can't imprison yourself forever. And it will bite you and transmit the dengue virus to your child, because mosquitoes are truly socialist. Sadhguru is talking about how terrible socialism has, damaged socialism has done to us, but mosquitoes are truly socialist. They do not respect rank or tradition or power. We need it for ourselves, not because of a higher goal. I think that's the best thing. I can tell you a way where mosquitoes will not be interested in you. Really, if you take off salt from your diet completely, mosquitoes will not be interested in biting you. Many may believe that that's a worse life than having mosquitoes, babe, aren't you? <laughs> Sadhguru <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes. Who has the microphone? Why don't you sit with a, the financial minister or prime minister and ask for some amount of money to locate uh, the right education schools like Isha or whatever it may be to educate the right people, uh, the education to the people, why don't you sit with the Prime Minister to look at, all, uh, to look at the right schools over, all over the India? So because you're saying this is really uh, need, uh, uh, the economy or political, whatever it may be. If you are right, if your experience is right, why don't you do that? This is my question. You're asking Sadhguru? Yes, Sadhguru. So for your information, if you do not already know, there is nothing much the Prime Minister can do right now. <laughs> Who, whoever can do, and Sadhguru. Anyway, whoever can do, why don't we talk to them? As a part of this, almost fifteen years ago, 
I went because our work was in rural India, I went to min meet the rural development minister in the center. He was a very wonderful man. I found a lot of politicians on a personal level, they're wonderful people, but they've become victims of their own making and situation also. So he was very wonderful, he took me to the… you know, we met him in the parliament building, he took me into this rural development ministry office, then he told me so enthusiastically, he told me all the schemes that they have. I sat there for three days looking at all the schemes that were relevant to make a difference in rural India. These are extremely well thought out schemes. Whoever made these things, thought through everything, made fantastic plans, you must have access to this as an IS officer at one time. Very be I was surprised that somebody has been doing phenomenal work. They've done great work. And then I… after looking at all this, again I went and sat with the minister, this is fantastic, when is this going to happen? He said, uh, you know, last year we had fourteen thousand crores left unused because nobody is coming forward to do this. Fantastic schemes, there is a budget. You can't ask for anything more. We know what's the solution. We have worked out the solution in entire detail and there is budget, but nobody is there to do it. This is the country you are living in. Even if the prime minister has the intention, he cannot do much right now because there is a whole system. So instead of going on trying to revive a system, system which is cancer-ridden, to deliver goods to the people. I, I was… Uh, I was on st uh, dais with some local ministers in Tamil Nadu and uh, somebody gave me an information… May information, I said, out of every rupee that is spent in the government schemes, only twelve paisa reaches the project. On the way, this much goes away. The minister who's sitting next to me said, Sadhguru, no, not twelve paisa, it's only four paisa. I said, well, you must be in the no <laughs> And I, I corrected myself, no, no, not twelve paisa, only four paisa out of a rupee is reaching the project. Ninety-six paisa gets lost somewhere on the way. If four paisa got lost, we can say, okay, let's go on, let's revive the system and make it happen. If only four paisa is being delivered, that is not even a system, isn't it? Even if you throw it in the air, four paisa will fall in your pocket. You don't need a system for this. If only four percent is reaching it, you cannot call it a system. That is why I'm going on talking business, business, business is because businesses can deliver. When we say business, we are talking about a completely new system. And right now the whole country and the world is fired up to be economically successful. This is the right time to change the things. As many things as possible, as many services as possible, including giving birth certificate, give it to private agencies, okay? Put stringent laws, if they subvert, something else will happen. You will see, they will come looking where a baby is born and give birth certificate. Yes or no? They will come looking and give it. If there are ten agencies in this town, there will be a competition, they will be looking, when will you have birth in your house? <laughs> the moment you're pregnant, they will already book you up. <laughs> yes or no? So, I am talking about changing the entire system because there is a point to which you can repair something. You know? You bought your Maruti car in two thousand, it's twelve years, you've used it extensively but still you can repair. You bought your ambassador car in nineteen fifty, it is better either you buy a bicycle or walk or if you can afford, buy a new car. You can't go on fixing it because fixing it becomes more expensive than putting up a new system. This system that we're talking about, the economic module which we have already chosen, market economy, doesn't cost to establish the system. There is no cost to the establishment. You just have to make the laws and leave it to the people. Right from there, from that village itself, answers will come. 
Right now everybody is looking to Delhi for answers, schemes and schemes. They got all the answers which can't be delivered. Sadhguru, I think we'll take the last two questions so that… We… we understood that there should be an economist or a businessman should be a leader, right? That is what we are trying to understand here. Now, my… my question is… Uh, no, no, I'm not only talking about a businessman becoming a leader. I'm talking about business moving into the leadership. There's a difference between the two. For example, you say… Uh, I mean, Guruji, you said that any businessman, he won't have prejudice or he might not have any morals or… I don't know. What I think is, any businessman will definitely have his own ethics and morals, he would be running his own business. No, 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 no. I'm telling, I do not trust anybody's ethics and morals. Nation doesn't have the patience to check your ethics and morals. We need laws which are enforceable, one hundred percent enforceable. We are… this is the problem, Indian… this is a serious Indian problem, what you're saying. This is the problem, we go on talking about morality, we go on talking about charity, sharing. Leave this, it's not worked. That is socialism, it's not worked. Isn't it? It worked only when there was strong bonding in communities, among their own castes, among their own creeds, they supported each other, they shared and they did things. That bonding is gone. Now that system will not work. Sadhguru, his question is, for everybody's uh, hearing, can nineteenth century politics and twenty-first century economy coexist unless one of them being compromised? Uh, it is very wrong to think we are doing nineteenth century politics. We are doing twentieth century politics. You are just having a taste of twenty-first century politics and it's leaving a distaste in our mouths. So this is twenty-first century politics, never before anybody had ever imagined for an assembly seat, somebody is going to spend twenty-five crores or fifty crores, is an un unimaginable thing even ten years ago. So it is purely twenty-first century politics, not nineteenth century politics. The question is, what are your views on Anna Hazare? Sadhguru, he asked you, I'll certainly give my views if they ask me, but Sadhguru, you must respond. <laughs> My interest is not Anna Hazare, my interest is nation. I am not interested in Anna Hazare, I am not interested in Indira Gandhi, I am not interested in Narendra Modi, I am interested in this country. Country means people. So, I went to Hazare's meeting when he was fasting and I also spoke there and supported them in so many ways. I never see Anna Hazare as a solution, I don't. But it is very significant that somebody is playing that role of bringing that awareness, firing up the whole nation towards a cause. There is no question of the significance of his role, but at the same time we should not overplay this role because this Jan Lokpal, whatever we are talking about, you can pick a hundred holes in it. You know, you want corruption to go, you want people's awareness to come to it, that's perfect, no question. But now, if you bring a law which supersedes every other law, you will have big problems. And how will you populate these positions which will enforce these laws? If already all the criminal procedures codes that you have, is being enforced by people who are corrupt and misusing it in a thousand different ways. How do you know tomorrow the Lokpal, where do you import them from, I'm asking? Once again, everybody will try to get into Lokpal now. Everybody is trying to get into the parliament, everybody is trying to get into the, you know, whatever the system. Now once you see this is the power, if he's saying in uh, Andhra Pradesh forty-two elected representatives, is it? Or people who stood for election, who are criminals, or they got, got elected? Most of them were elected or… or okay. okay. So forty-two people in one assembly are people with established crime behind them. Tomorrow, after ten years, they will all understand Lokpal is the place to be, parliament is not the place to be, and they will all enter that. And with such sweeping powers, it will become a very dangerous force. But I don't believe what he is doing is right, but it is appropriate. Right now it is needed. 
Right now we need to shake up people and tell them, if you don't do this, we're going to hang you. Somebody needs to do this and he is doing that, hats off to him, he's managed to somehow. But it's a limited role. He and people around him must understand, it's a limited role. If you stretch it beyond that, that will become the problem. We have reached a time in our nation where the question is not about who is corrupt. The question is about who is not corrupt, unfortunately. If the question was who is corrupt, it would be easy to fix it. The question is who is not corrupt. One Jayaprakash Narayan is a shining example. It is… it is fortunate that we are sitting with him here, but it's unfortunate, it's very unfortunate that somebody who is not corrupt is so important for us because millions of them should have been not corrupt. But now we've brought this nation in sixty-five years. Sixty-five years ago, people were willing to walk on the street and throw their lives for this nation. Today we've brought this to a point where a man who is not corrupt is a celebrity. We have to change this. We have to make Jayaprakash Narayan an ordinary citizen of this nation. Uh, absolutely, Sadhguru. <laughs> What is the minimum requirement has now become the maximum qualification, unfortunately. You're absolutely right. Sadhguru, I think it's a wonderful blend of spiritualism with pragmatism. It's rare to find a spiritual leader give us such absolutely compelling See, I'm logic. See, trying to bring him down, he's trying to praise me <laughs> Such compelling arguments and response to real challenges of life. Thank you Sadhguru for that reality check. Thank you very much. We are much. deeply grateful to you for this interaction.